presented live on local access. Um, so know that as, as you uh, prepare your statements. Um, and um, I just want to say real quick, we're, we're going to do open session in a minute, but then we're just going to do a quick little um, flip of a couple of the agenda items to get Travis up here to do a quick sort of status presentation. Apparently he was doing something the other day. I was snowing out for 26 hours or whatever. So um, anyway, so open session. Do we have anyone here for open session? Deb, hi. Hi. Come on up. So I'm just here to give you guys a little bit of an update so you don't think any of us you know, are sleeping at the job or anything like that. This is um, a survey that we had um, done up by Sidewalk. Um, this is um, not being presented to you tonight because we have just a couple of little notes, notations that still need to be put on the um, survey. And of course, because I'm not on your agenda. So um, I tried to look ahead to see when the next agenda is. February 4th, maybe? 4th is the next meeting. Is the next meeting. Okay, so we'll have you know, our petition uh, done up for you and have how many copies of this would you guys need? Not everybody doesn't need one, right? I, I, zero. I mean, meeting electronic would be. Electronic? Can't be put up there, huh? Yeah. Electronic, we'll electronic drop up there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'll, yeah. I'll get it sent to you I, electronically. It's probably a good idea to bring one so that we can flip it around as we're yep. all sort of sitting around here, but okay. we'll be able to look at this too, but okay. it might be easier right. for you to have something in front of you. All right. So really the purpose here is just so that you guys know we're still committed and we're still moving ahead and we've invested, you know, time and money into the project. Um, you, I'm guessing all of you have, this is kind of like a little primer. It's like a little check seat. This is something that KP Law has put out. Okay. I know um, this is sometime from last year i'm positive you have it in your emails but i can send it again if you would like me to do that um, it's sort of like a little check sheet as to how a road takeover happens and what their recommendations are um, one of the recommendations that they have on here which is not a requirement is for any title work that might need to be done it's something we would really like to avoid having to do if we can for expense um, reasons? For expense reasons, yeah, because we're already putting a lot into this. Um, we have hired a lawyer, so she um, will be drawing up all the necessary paperwork for not only getting an article on the warrant, but also for the paperwork that's needed for us to um, gift you the road. So, uh, Okay, I, great. I'm glad everything's still progressing with yep. you. Um, I think it, what we've learned, right? Well, let us go over some things we've learned, which is terminology is really important. Right. Right. So that warrant article, probably not a bad idea to bounce it around between the lawyers when the time comes to yep. make sure that it's exactly right. Who Who would be the name of the um, the contact person at KP Law that our lawyer? Ryan should? McLean. Oh. I'll funnel it for you. Okay. Yeah, we'll go through him. Okay. Sure. And then we'll get it to the right, um, you know, specialist. That okay. would handle that. At, so at I could just give her your email address. Would that be okay? Our lawyer? Yeah, she yeah. knows me. I'm okay. Sure All right. Are Great. you still, still dealing with the opposition that, you, that you've been having? Um, well, I'm, uh, I'm, we're, we're working hard to have that not be an issue. Is there any residents <laughs> on the creepy. road that aren't on board with <laughs> this? Or That's why I asked the opposition. Yeah, question. well, I know about that one. Yeah. Well, there's, <laughs> no, there's no residents that okay. aren't on board. There is um, one section of road that is an access point um, more towards the north and I don't know which page it's going to be on. This is the, the piece of property that I had um, emailed about uh, a while ago that was in tax title for a while with the town. It used to belong to um, a company called West Hub Realty and they didn't pay their taxes for 10, 12, 15 years, something like that. But it went to auction and um, it was recently sold to another company. Mm -hmm. So I do have um, a phone call out and emails out to that company to see. They have a little 50 foot access piece. It's right here that I need to um, get them to see what they're going to do. So, how well do you so. know your road now? You know your road pretty well? And all my neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, it sounds so. like. Sounds like it's going as you planned. Yeah, to know? I, I think um, for, for the most part. So I just I just wanted you guys to know that we were we're working on it, really? and um, we have the dates for making sure we have the the article ready. <coughs> and um, so one of the things that um, not only that I, I mentioned about um, I, we'd like for there not to have to be um, title work done if we can, 
Um, and if it's, if, you know, KP law, it says they absolutely are going to require that you guys make us do that. Um, then, then our second request would be that we would not have to have that done until after the town vote because there is no sense to having, we have 120 days to get all the paperwork after the town vote. You guys probably all know that. Um, but there's no sense to having to pay for work that there's no reason Won't to pay happen. for. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. It sounds logical, but. <laughs> you know, well, so. I think you guys have the power to just say that's how you, that you're gonna, you know, that really has nothing to do with KP law because like I said, it is not, it is not required. <coughs> there's no state law that requires that work to be done. And certainly you guys can say you're not gonna require us to pay for it ahead of time. Uh, agreed, but do you so. know, <clears throat> Do you know what what the town's um, risk would be to not have it done? And again, um, I'm not I'm not angry. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I probably don't know 100. percent I mean, we we have you know provided certainly the surveyor with all of our deeds and all of our titles, and um, the lawyer that we've hired also has all of that. So um, I just I can't even see that it's an issue in part because. You know, the, the north end of the road, um, it's not even part of people's deeds because it just wasn't laid out that way. They own up to the edge of the, the road. Yep. Um, and so, therefore, there, as you probably know, there's a state law that, that reverts, everybody reverts to the middle of the road um, when they don't have it in their deeds. But so what would the title search it would come up with nothing on that end sure. because they're because it's not part of their deeds so it's kind of silly to have it required um so, okay. so what i can do is compare this to um kp law when we went through this for the last town meeting gave us this is what you need to do to make this a road so i can compare it to that mm -hmm. if i get the electronic plans and say a letter from the residents saying that they all intend to file this mm -hmm. so we have yep i'm some gonna get justification that for, for spending the money then i can get options to the board for the next meeting okay. on how it should be written up or, or what should be done or can we put off something like a title yeah. search etc okay. yep so next meeting if you know that, that's what I'm going to be asking for some, some voting on so I'll do a little research okay great thank you okay. any, any thanks, questions or anything okay. like okay nothing great well, thanks for your time okay. I appreciate it thank you, thank you. Well, you want to do uh, one quick announcement before we have trap come up? Yeah, it's just the announcements. Um, so it's still the um, frozen assets is coming up. The, the um, structure is not on the pond yet. It won't be placed on there until February, like mid-February. It's actually still being worked on. Uh, so people can put in guesses. I don't know how many Katie has received to date, um, but you have until the first to submit them, and then the prizes obviously go. There's, there's four prizes. It's a $20 donation. She just wants to stress that if you don't have the $20, you can still put in a guess and you're still el eligible for prizes. Um, the donation, all that goes towards is just future events for the special events fund. I mean, if you have $5 that you want to give, if you want to donate something, you can. If you have nothing, uh, give $100 you want to donate, it doesn't matter. It's just a suggested donation. But again, if you have nothing, you know, we'd rather have the guesses in. Let's get it moving and going forward than, you know, nothing at all. And where, and where can we find this? Uh, so it can be found here. It can be found at Yakimo's Pizza Palace. I think the hub of the hub. I did send out an email blast today telling people where they can get it. Um, so there were quite a few. There was like five different locations, and you can just go in, fill out the form, and then um, you know she'll she'll be going around picking them up or mm -hmm. here. You know if you want to come in here. Okay, thanks. Okay, we'll come up. The country trail. Challenging, challenging first one there, huh? I know it's not the first one, but challenging one in a while. Yeah. It, uh, it seemed like it was never going to end. Okay. So hey, <laughs> so we we asked you to come in here, um, <clears throat> talking uh, at our last meeting. It actually, had zero to do with us thinking a storm was actually. Oh, go ahead. He prepared a handout too that we, that we gave have in front of us. Yes. Okay. And so okay, we've already sort of uh, as I take a quick perusal through this as I bring it over here, I can already tell what you've done. But anyway, for everybody else, I guess is we've asked you to come just to get a snapshot of where we're at. You know, we we drive around town, right? We live in town. We, we can have a feel for how the winter's been, but we don't really know because we know that we've heard from so many years that, you know, a little event can still take a lot of time, take a lot of money because it's cold enough and it's slippery and all that sort of stuff. So I guess we just wanted to get a, 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 an update of where you think you're at um, uh, as of now. 
I kind of gave you um, this this write out that I did. Yep. And I do it for every storm we have, so there's a, more or less an explanation of where the salt goes and how much and how come. So I started towards the and I started putting road temps in because that way you kind of understand because a lot of these storms in the beginning are 30s, 40s, it was raining but we we're treating because the ground temperature was less than freezing so um, what happened was is that's unfortunate what we had we had the big storm there as a heavy wet snow depending on the type of snow that comes down um, depends on how we treat you know it's uh, if we get that wet heavy snow it packs really easy if you don't have a treatment down you get the hard pack and then it takes twice as much to get it up so we we do the half treats and depending on what it is I mean I think we've done pretty good trying to figure out what <coughs> nature has thrown at us so far I mean this one that the between being warm and then going to negative numbers after that I mean every town around us I think we came out pretty good on it but you could see in other towns using just um, a mix of sand and salt their roads are covered still you know back to what ours used to be and um, depending on what you're using for chemical the temperature as a you could see as it was getting colder the less the salt one uh, the salt we're using goes to negative six so I mean it was going for a while there until uh, it kept spitting so we've got we've got just as you know sort of what I wanted to see there are 30 events on here yep. in my quick count which is more than I would have thought. You know, I know uh, some of them are spot sanding, a couple of those, but overall, I mean, there's, there's still a, you, a fair amount of u utilization to date. You actually have a couple of that are two days in a row, so if you really did, it's really 32. No, I kind of booked those. Yeah. I think it's the third. Because I got um, through here <laughs> as like mid, mid, midstream, I had shown what we were, and then I had gone to obviously today, mm -hmm. so that way you show what we are up to date you know where we stand with the salt so right now I always had a quarter shed of salt and right now I got just over half of the four loads that we have so I always keep that reserve in case so it looks like one one treatment of the town is about 20, 20 tons okay. so what what um how do you, how, how we stand but uh, without without nailing you down on exact dollars here how do you how do we stand I'm looking what I had done I spent some time as I stayed after the, for the meeting here and I kind of looked to see where we were this time last year and um, where we are this year so <clears throat> right now um, the budget for the winter we're at with the salt that we have in the shed right now we stand at seventy nine thousand four hundred and thirty nine dollars that's what we have left in the kitty out of that kitty comes out of winter diesel and any winter repairs that go with the trucks along with the salt so if that money right there was just salt I feel that we could possibly make the year just right there but looking towards what we had in diesel um, diesel and repairs of last year which was right around 36,000 you know just about 37 um, I'm probably looking that we'll have that overage because we're right now we stand um, about 20,000 with the diesel and repairs that we have. We just have a broken spring. We have a couple of things on the, the sidewalk. 20,000 expended? Yeah. Okay. Expended so far. Yep. So, I mean, right now, actually, we have 15, 15 and a half spended in the diesel and the repair. We I ordered 2,000 diesel, so that's $4,600. So, as of um, tomorrow, the bill will be twenty thousand. We have expended in diesel and repair. And how does the manpower factor into all this? That has its own separate line item for the overtime. No, yeah, I, I guess I meant where do we stand? Same relative question in the manpower piece of what we budgeted versus where we think we're at right now. So far, so good. Looks good for the overtime. I mean, trying to keep it as tight as we can, yeah. but the storms. I mean, the weatherman can't even predict it. So I'm oh, trying to. I mean. And we got hammered in the last year, right? Yeah. It was, was it February where we got all the storms? We got three in a row or March or whatever yeah. that was. We yeah, I mean, it's it's been, I guess, a quiet winter for snow, but yeah. it's been a mess. I mean, it's going to be a mess. We're going to get rain tomorrow. Yeah. I got ground temps of 18. We're going to be treating, mm -hmm. you know, and if it, it stays a heavy, wet rain all through the whole deal, which is Thursday also, 
it's coming in cold at the end of it, so you're going to be treating again. It's all the to dirt roads. The 50s on Thursday. Yeah, yeah. and all the dirt roads are going yeah. to ice over. Yeah. yeah. You know, so it's it's a mess. So, hey, I got a question. So, on <coughs> Friday night uh, evening, I guess, I, I was picking up my daughter, and uh, I went in. Um, I actually pulled into a driveway, and then the, 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 the salt truck came by spreading salt. I went inside, and then... Uh, Ten minutes later, another parent came to pick up their kid and said, I think you guys are already getting ice and snow and stuff. And I said, no, 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 that was the, 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 the salt that just went by. Did you increase application for this storm because of what was coming, or is that just the normal amount? No, the one that goes by yours actually It wasn't my house. It was, it was Natty. Natty Pond? No. No? No. They're all calibrated, but two of our newer trucks, the 18 and the 15 Freightliner, have electronic spinners in them. So it really takes the guesswork out of everything. They just pretty much turn the button on. As they move, it goes on, puts out the correct amount that we want per lane mile, which is 250. And they have another button that they can click it to to cut it for a half treatment. So during the storm, where you don't need a full treatment, you can just do half just to keep it loose. And I guess that's what I meant, though, too. Is this was this due to what was coming? Was this yeah pre-treat? So if you saw them before anything was happening, it was a pre-treat before yep. they were. And what they were doing is it was natty pond they're doing the side roads first less traffic so they don't blow it off the road okay. and then then they do their mains last so <clears throat> in that i tell them when they're doing their side roads if you see it start coming down to go right to your mains and start hitting them and then go back and finish your, your sides after but usually that's why you see us out before okay. they're, they're on their side streets doing them first because they usually before i had gotten neglected and not gotten to because we waited close to when it was coming down, hitting the mains and never getting to them. So. How's uh, morale down there? Everybody seems to be getting along. Still, yeah, it's, it has its ups and downs, but the winter, <laughs> you know, everybody, uh, mm-hmm. you don't see enough sun, you go to work in the dark, you go home in the dark, and then you have 26 hours of continuous plowing of weather. I mean, it gets on anybody's nerves, you know what I mean? So. It does, but it's, you know, in your leadership and management position, part of that is in your job description, right? To sort of be able to try to manage that best you can. And yep, five different personalities. Right. Yeah, no, I know. I'm just, I mean, that's part of the job. <laughs> five, there's five different personalities, and everyone has a bad day sooner or later, so I'm just the one person that reflects on them, I guess. But do my best to keep everybody happy down there as best as I can with what I got, so. Okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, how about the um, equipment? Where are we at with the, uh, I know you just talked, touched on it a little bit, but uh, overall, uh, any sort of significant um, things you see on the cusp of happening? No, uh, Neil, our new mechanic's been great. He's uh, done a, kept up on everything. We've had two trucks. He found a wire break on one, so he'll be fixing that tomorrow. And then we have the Mac that's got uh, some spring issues, so that's going to be replaced tomorrow and hopefully be done tomorrow. And time for the storm. So, uh, in the midst of that, I mean, everything's been up and running. He's got the huff loader up and running, which was uh, prior to him was on its deathbed and needed a new piece of equipment. So, uh, he's actually fixed the motor in it, and we've used that. And we've used the brush mower. Now we've used that all summer. Plus, that's what we're doing now mm-hmm. while the the snow is not on the ground between ground cut and brush mowing. So. Uh, I see they did on Wood Road. They did a good job. Yeah, we're pr- trying to get everywhere in town because the more we can open up, we can cut <coughs> the shoulders and get it back to where it is, and then brush mowing won't take as long to do. We can probably pretty much hit everything every year and keep it for the winter time, you know. So. Travis, I see the guys went out on uh, Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. Tell them we appreciate that, you know, being away from the families and everything. Long hours on the holiday. And Martin Luther King Day. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I guess I I just unless somebody's got I do just here. have a couple things to add. So the innovations that Travis is is adding to our town, especially calibrating the salt, is really allowing us to hone in on costs. And just for the public to understand, we budget one hundred and sixty thousand for winter supplies, which is the diesel, the repairs, and the salt we're talking about. One hundred and sixty is about the cost of the salt. So, in a, in an average year, so um, the DPW starts behind the eight ball it's underfunded because of the way that that account can be spent in deficit so um, i put a tremendous amount of pressure on travis to control costs as i am across across the town 
um, and to enforce some policies <coughs> which can also um, you know, cause some of the morale issues or other things is, is I'm, I'm trying to control costs while still telling our guys um, thank you for your service and all those other things. So as we implement these policies and try and create some sustainability, there, there is some pressures there on, on the department and I appreciate the way they're responding um, because we overspent that account by 90000 last year, which is not... What type of policies are you talking about? You said implementing policies, new policies? Just trying to control costs. Okay. So policies in terms of um, how, we, how we spend money in the DPW, what type of reserves we have, just analyzing how much salt goes down on the road, right? So that causes, uh, you know, Travis to, might, to maybe say, hey, you need to make sure you're not putting too much salt on the road, right? Which it, it can be a change when uh, sometimes people expect to say, just know that, for example, uh, is one of the policies. <coughs> but that's because um, for every dollar that we overspend the account by, uh, that's a dollar we don't have in free cash to purchase equipment and other things in our capital plan. So I just want to get a true assessment of costs in all the departments, and uh, that, that can cause some, some pressure, of course, because budget, sure. budgets are difficult. Okay, I mean, um, you know, I think we've had a good start this season as far as I'm concerned. Um, I think, as we all know, last year was, was like a watershed year for uh, all the accolades that were, you know, bestowed upon you guys as a team. Um, to execute things so well. So I guess we just look forward to seeing more of that the rest of the year here. And um, <clears throat> please let us know what you need from us. Appreciate it. Thanks, sir. Hello. Hi, Mike. Just wrap it up here to get everything. You wanna Good job on the rest. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Love you guys. Gotcha. Yours might be dead. He has your charger, so we can transfer it over. Your say, say that again? That might be dead. All might be dead. That's what we have a charger. Yes. Right uh, so, um, our next item of business is uh, the presentation of the fiscal year 20 to 24 capital plan presentation. Um, nice to see you guys again. Thanks Welcome. Thanks for having us. Um, and it's, this is going to be the floor of yours, unless you don't want it to be uh, at any point during. Uh, you having the floor, and if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourselves as you start off, and we can uh, sort of go from there. Yep, absolutely. Um, if you have any questions or anything, comments, you know, feel free to interrupt us, but we'll run through our presentation, and at the end we do have time for questions or comments or to explain things in further depth. Okay. All right, just, so. I'm sorry, just yep. to orient the um, capital plan, the actual written and the narrative went out to earlier this week and you viewed it in your folders the presentation we have today so that's what's up here and, and what they're discussing from but everything comes from the plan yeah there are other documents um, not only the formal plan that Ryan's talking about but all the working documents those are like the <coughs> spreadsheets and all the different things that we use to actually create the plan which we turn over to Ryan and he's going to share with the capital planning committee and anybody else in town who's going to be a part of that process going forward. So just so you know, there's other stuff um, that, that we'll be handing off to. So we share with everyone. Everyone gets. Everyone it. can have it. Everyone can be involved. It's more fun that way. So, um, <clears throat> my name is Sarah Concanon. I am uh, from the Collin Center for Public Management at UMass Boston, and uh, this is my colleague Rick Kingsley, and I'll have him introduce himself in a minute. Um, but the Collin Center, for those of you who don't know is set up like a consulting firm. It was set up by the state legislature a decade ago to provide technical assistance to municipalities, um, state agencies, other public districts in the Commonwealth and also a little bit outside of the Commonwealth, other states we've done some work in. Um, and we do a wide range of uh, um, services to municipalities from finance uh, work like capital planning and budgeting work, policy writing to executive recruitment or town administrator or superintendent perhaps. Um, we do stuff in the HR world like paying class studies, job descriptions, and a lot of other things too. Um, so we've worked in many municipalities all around the state, nearly all of the counties in the state, except for Dukes County, I think. Um, <laughs> so uh, we have a lot of experience and I've been at the Collins Center for um, almost seven years. I do started doing data analytics, but now I mainly do finance work um, located in Central Mass. So I get to come out and um, work with uh, everybody in Central Mass, and also I handle uh, Western Mass a lot. 
want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Rick Kingsley. I worked at the Division of Local Services for 30 years where I headed up their municipal consulting operation, uh, their municipal data bank, and the distribution of local aid and the issuance of cherry sheets. Uh, I've been at the Collins Center for the last three and a half years. Um, I work on all matters of uh, finance projects, capital plans, financial forecasts, financial management reviews. I remember being here about 10 years ago doing a management review for uh, Hubbardston for the Division of Local Services. So. Okay. So just a sort of a, a, a initial quick question. Mm -hmm. um, this exact sort of five-year capital improvement plan is, is a quite common thing for you guys to participate in? Yes, so we've done, um, I'm not sure exactly what number you are, but well over two dozen in the last, I think it's three, three and a half years. Um, it's obviously something that we recommend that all municipalities have. Um, and a lot of the ones that we're doing now um, are through, funded through the Community Compact Grant Program, which is how yours was funded. So we, we are finding that a lot of municipalities are saying, oh, now that there's money to do it, let's do it. Uh, Guilty. So, yeah, which is great. Um, why not? So, um, so, yeah, we do have um, a lot of experience doing capital planning in cities, you know, as big as greater than 50,000 and small towns as well, all over the state. So to kick us off, I just want to sort of set the stage and provide you our definitions of a, what is a capital project. And this was communicated to the department heads um, and also what is a capital improvement plan versus a capital budget. So for Hubbardston, the definition that we used was a major non-recurring expense that has a useful life of at least three years and a cost uh, typically greater than $10,000. Um, now that as you saw in the plan, there were a few projects that fell under 10,000, and that's okay because um, <coughs> they were too expensive to be absorbed in the operating budget, so we put them in the capital. In terms of a capital improvement plan, what makes it different than just a capital budget? Uh, number one, it's multi-year, so in this case we did a five-year plan. Number two, it's comprehensive, which means it's covering all the departments, all the funding sources, not only money that's uh, your general fund money, but grants, other special loan programs, and other types of local money like CPA funds, things like that. Um, and also the plan is financially viable. So not only do we look at the project side of the equation, but it's Rick's job to look at the financial side of the equation and say, here's what you can spend not only next year, but here's what I project would be available for the four out years. So years two through five of the plan. Okay. So this will just be mostly for the many people watching on TV. Um, Got that but right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a YouTube celebrity because I go to so many of these <laughs> board meetings. So it's it's pretty great. Um, I've never had an autograph um, requested of me, but you know, <laughs> one day. Um, so y you here know this, but just what happens if you don't have a, a CIP? Well, you can sort of get along. It's it it's not ca catastrophic, but it but it could be. Um, um, a hindrance to the municipality so some of the things that might happen there could be a negative impact to some public health or public safety potentially even a legal liability exposure for the municipality you might have staff that are operating in an inefficient way or an ineffective way you might be faced with costly emergency repairs so rather than replacing a truck um, that you know is imminently going to fail you know and preparing for it you have Travis come and say the truck failed and it's the middle of winter, so we have to replace it. And guess what? We don't have the luxury of trying to find a used vehicle. We don't have the luxury of shopping around. We have to get whatever we can get um, because we have a storm, things like that. Um, poorly managed or poorly timed projects. And the classic example is um, really related to pavement and utilities. Like we pave a road and then two years later, we have to do the water infrastructure underneath it or something with that similar type of timing issue uh, with a comprehensive multi-year plan, you can avoid that because it goes out publicly, the DPW can talk to um, the, the water superintendent and say, I'm going to do this road, and then you know they'll say, well, let's do the water infrastructure at the same time. Um, inconsistent debt service, so one of the things, one of the basic principles of establishing a capital plan, which Rick, I'm sure, will talk about, is trying to keep debt service smooth so that it uh, doesn't have negative impacts on your operating budget. And then just generally financial disorder and potentially negative impacts on bond rating. 
Um, <clears throat> in the final report, we have an introductory chapter that kind of lays out what the town's capital assets are so that folks can really understand um, what the town is responsible for maintaining because it's not just the trucks that you see or the cruisers that you see. You know, it's, it's all of the buildings and all of the small outbuildings like gazebos and things like that. It's your IT assets. Um, it's all the recreational fields, the conservation areas, the playground. Um, 82 and a half miles of road, um, 22 bridges and large culverts, and um, many other smaller culverts, um, which is a lot of bridges and, and major culverts. That's a lot for a town. And about 42 pieces of major equipment or vehicles. And there's more detail in the report if folks are interested in that. So now I'm just going to walk through our sort of general process uh, at a high level so you can understand what it is that we did. I think we started around the beginning of the fiscal year, right? I think it was July. So what we do first is talk to all the department heads, including any board or committee that might have oversight of a capital asset or want to participate. So we come for the whole day and sit with folks, and um, they're, they're welcome to come and meet with us. And we ask them, what capital needs might you have? Um, we collect a certain amount of data um, on each capital project. We actually use an online form. Survey Monkey, and then we take all of that information, download it into a big spreadsheet, go back and forth with department heads to get clarifying information. Um, <clears throat> using the information that we were given, we score every project, and then we turn it over to the town administrator and work. Ryan and I worked closely together to prioritize projects. Let me just add real quick, if you would yep. mind. <clears throat> I'm on the town center committee with Alicia. I don't know if you guys met with Alicia, but she was one of the representatives in there. It's yep. really easy to do all that as far as um, user friendly. So mm -hmm. I'm just that's all I'm saying is that it's not like it's a burden on you know the departments and going about doing it. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty straightforward, and for the major departments, typically a DPW. I will sit one on one with them so that they don't have to sit there and submit 45 different forms sure. online. So we do we do provide that because it can be it can be a lot uh, for the major departments. Um, <clears throat> while Ryan and I are working on the project side of things, uh, Rick is working with the financial staff and um, oftentimes financial advisor to develop the capital investment strategy, which he'll talk more in depth about. Um, after we know the finance side of things, after that is clear, then Ryan can finalize the plan and decide, okay, these are the projects that we want in our final cut. Um, looking into the future, once the plan has been passed, adopted, um, the job of the town administrator and anybody else involved is to manage the plan, you know, make sure the projects get done, make sure that changes get absorbed into the plan and any um, impacts that are triggered by changes get um, figured out and then you repeat the process annually. Um, so, so if questions? I could just jump in for one second. Yeah. So um, on this slide here, talking about these large projects, you see s some sticker shock there, a $15 million uh, project to build a new building. <coughs> so what I asked the architect to do was to give us the highest possible number there. The reason why we went back and forth, Sarah and I, on this a lot, um, whether or not we should include building and infrastructure in the capital plan because it's clearly identified as a need. We've talked about it as a board, including it in the plan. But we wanted to create a sustainable plan that um, either addressed the buildings or didn't. So it's kind of just plugged in here as a placeholder as we need to do these buildings. Mm -hmm. So I just didn't want to gloss <coughs> over that because it's obviously the biggest number in this and, and it, it is representing the overall need of building and infrastructure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I just wanted no, to make sure no, that's fine. no one passed out. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of the capital needs, which are all of the projects that we received from every department or board, we got 68 project requests, a little bit over um, $34.7 million in total. And just to um, sort of show you how much of that is taken up by just a few projects, I've listed out the, the, the top three largest projects. And you have, uh, I, I kind of cheated a little bit and combined. The second bullet is a few projects combined. But as Ryan said, there was the major building project at 15 million, 13.25 million for significant road and bridge projects. And that's all state and federal funding. So no local dollars. And then uh, 1.5 million to potentially replace the roof at the center school. 
and slightly more of ha more than half would be anticipated to be reimbursed through MSBA. So including that 3.25 would be the northern section of 68, would be the town center itself, similar to what we just did on the southern section of 68? Yeah. The mm -hmm. bridge projects like Evergreen Bridge, which sure. is 2.2 million alone. Yep, all the projects on the tip. And I can, I think in the plan, I actually pull them out into a separate table so that everyone can see uh, because getting projects on the tip is a really great way for towns to accomplish very expensive but very important projects. So, um, you know, it's not like the state's coming around and saying, here's some money, what do you want to do with it? You have to be proactive about getting it. And so, you know, for folks, the public who don't know, it's it's not just every town that can get, you know, $13 million in, in state and federal money. So that's um, something to be um, commended, I think, for, for Hubbardston. This is important, though, too, right? We're in the midst of this. You know, we have to spend three or 400000 to design <laughs> exactly. to get to the point where they know you're serious and you can get far enough along onto that tip, you know, uh, That's absolutely path. true. So part of being proactive is putting the money into design work to show we have this shovel-ready project, we've put skin in the game, and then, you know, you take that 300000 or whatever you put in, you know, for design, and it turns into $4 million in seven years or ten years. And so it is a long process, but it's, it's definitely well worth it. Um, okay. So in terms of scoring projects, we have a scoring methodology that we use um, and different criteria are weighted <coughs> in different ways. Um, it's, it's, not, it's more complex than, um, than... You think you can handle? I think you... No. <laughs> what I was going to say is it's not a simple method, but it's not very difficult to do. I mean, it, it looks more complex on the outside, but we have a sheet that explains how to do it. These are the criteria that we use, so I'll just run through them quickly. Um, is the project a state or federal mandate, or is there some legal, legal obligation or liability exposure? Is there a threat to health and safety? Does the project conform to other adopted plans or goals that the town has? What is the department's priority? Um, what is the impact on service to residents or businesses? How is the benefit distributed? Um, are there economic and environmental benefits? Does it have an impact on the operating budget? What is the availability and likelihood of external funding, so grant or something like that? What is the risk and impact of a failure of an asset? Uh, and what is the impact on internal effectiveness or efficiency? Um, and I should say that the scoring methodology can be great because it, you know, provides us an objective way of looking at things, but it's not as though we take the list, score it, and then say to Ryan, here you go, just put your stamp on it. It's just one piece of the puzzle so that um, there's some um, starting point for a discussion. So um, oftentimes top scoring projects make it into the plan, but a lower scoring project could make it into the plan. A top scoring project might not make it into the plan for whatever reason. All right, now I'm going to turn okay. it over to Rick. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the what the town has spent historically on capital and how we projected what the town should spend um, going forward. Um, what The question I got asked a lot when I was in my former job by all manner of local officials was, how much should we spend on capital? And obviously <coughs> that's a trade-off. It's a trade-off between the operating budget, the capital budget, school budget, op, you know, town budget, there's, there's a million different trade-offs in the budgetary equation. So, so when we look at um, how much you should spend on capital, I would, my first question would always be, well, how much are you spending now? And they would say, oh, nothing. And I'd say, well, <laughs> you know, you, you've, got to, you've got to ratchet that up. And the good news here is that the town of Hubbardston has made a pretty decent investment in each of the, you know, the prior three years we looked at. Um, you know, and that investment was pretty close to uh, six percent, a, a hair above six percent. So, so let me talk a little bit about the strategy we use to figure this out. Um, first of all, we look at non-excluded debt, what you have existing right now on the books. We also look at any authorized and unissued debt and make projections for what that debt service will be going forward once it's ultimately issued. And I think you have a fire truck and a dump truck uh, where the debt has not been issued yet. So we made some assumptions. Ten years on the fire truck, 
five years on the dump truck, I believe, uh, and make some interest rates ass assumptions based on current current borrowing rates, talking to your uh, financial advisor, <coughs> Dave Eisenthal. Um, so we also looked at the Quabbin debt. Um, you're paying a debt assessment to Quabbin, and your, your share of that is a, a little under 25%, 23.34%, I believe was the, the figure. So we project, I had the debt service schedule from the regional district, and I projected that out, you know, for the 10 years that um, Ryan asked us to do. And the, the last piece is the pay-as-you-go funding, which you typically uh, appropriate free cash for. So when you add all those together, <coughs> and then divide that into what I call the net budget. And what is the net budget? The net budget is your total amount to be raised from your tax rate recap, less any enterprise funds, which you don't have right now, less CPA, which I believe you do have, uh, less any excluded debt, okay? And the reason we take out excluded debt is because we wanna look at what is your general revenue picture of that total general revenue, your tax, le this is essentially your tax levy, your state aid, and your local receipts, okay? We pull out the available funds and we look at what is that as a percentage of that net budget. So in other words, what have you been devoting to capital from your existing recurring general fund revenues? Where's new growth in there? Uh, that's part of your tax levy. So, okay, so that, that would be well to the extent that you are taxing it, which I believe you're taxing pretty close to the limit um, under Prop Two and a Half, correct? Yes. Sir. yes. Right. So, uh, so the the new growth is in there to the extent that you appropriate it. If you if you don't use ten thousand of it, let's say, and you have excess levy capacity, then that ten thousand is not in there. But mm -hmm. by and large, it's what you actually tax what you actually receive in state aid that's general aid uh, and what you actually receive in local receipts. So, so that's, that's how those uh, percentages work. And you can see that they're right around 6%. FY18 was a bit above 6%. Uh, the average for those three years was 6.1%. So, so then going forward, what we did is we projected out all those <coughs> existing, uh, the existing debt service, the authorized and unissued, and then the Quabbin uh, debt assessment. We don't have anything here for pay as you go because that hasn't been determined yet. Uh, so, so this is the, the, about midway through that page that sums up all the existing stuff that you've already purchased that creates future obligations down the down the line in terms of debt. Just like if you borrow money for a house, you need to look at what that what those mortgage payments are out over the 30 years you borrowed it for. So, so then we uh, projected the net budget and we started from the 19 figure, which was, was up a bit from previous years in terms of the percentage increase. Uh, but generally speaking, that net budget grows by about 200,000 a year, give or take. And so, so essentially, if you use a 6% projection threshold, that 6% figure grows as your budget grows. So that preserves capital uh, spending in relation to your budget growth, which is a better method than say, well, we're gonna spend 500,000 on capital for the next 10 years. Well, when you get out 10 years and your budget has grown, that half a million may not be adequate anymore. So, so this is intended to, to grow incrementally with your budget growth. And to project that, we use Ryan's uh, revenue and expenditure forecast, which has, a, has about a 2.1% increase in spending. But aren't we just gonna be using that for the pay-as-you-go spending, free cash? You, well, the free cash is not included in the net budget. Uh, but it can still be a funding source to get you to that 6%, which is essentially what the town has relied on in the last three years for its pay-as-you-go okay, budget. Okay, so that's not robbing Peter to pay Paul, though? Uh, <coughs> no, it's, I, I, I think it's a way to look at how you're divvying up that general revenue between capital, you know, and to the extent you use free cash as a substitute that's not included in those calculations, you're freeing up money for other 
other things in that in that equation. Um, but I, I think it's a it's a, a fairly structured, methodical way to look at your spending, and and to um, project forward what you should be spending. I mean, granted, you could grow that if you decided to. You could increase it by a quarter percent a year. Um, but 6% is a pretty good figure. You know, I've seen some that are a tiny bit higher. Uh, I've Many seen, that are lower. Um, I've seen some that are virtually zero. Mm -hmm. and, and in that case, we try and ratchet them up over a five-year period by a half a percent a year, which... On average, where do you want to see it around? That's a good percentage. Between five and eight, probably. Mm -hmm. um, five and seven. I, I have seen some considerably higher, but uh, you know you don't even want to ask what community it was. Or, <laughs> you know, very, very different set mm -hmm. of circumstances. You mm -hmm. know, so good. Okay, so um, so Rick gives us this, um, and Ryan says yes or no, maybe. Um, but in this case, we said yes. We played around with some other target percentages, but we felt that six was, um, as Rick said, a very healthy number and um, sort of a, a continuation of what the town had already been doing. So um, Rick gives us the bottom line, which is, okay, after accounting for what you've already um, paid for and put on your books, this is what you have available for general fund resources for the new capital. And that was the bottom line of the last table you looked at. So we take that, Ryan and I take that, and we uh, take the top priority projects from the capital needs assessment, and we try to compare the costs of those projects with what we have available. And as part of that, we say, okay, these particular projects are <coughs> going to be most likely debt funded. So let's calculate the debt service on those projects so that we can find out what it will cost us in the in that fiscal year. So are we starting out at zero? Sorry to interrupt, but are we are basically saying prior to fiscal year 20 here, we're at zero for this analysis? Um, clarify what well, you mean. Maybe you I, you know, at the, the top part of the, the second sheet that I showed is your, your existing obligations. So, so, so what I did was um, I applied the 6% to your projected budget to get the, the second to the last line in that slide. And then from that number, we subtract your existing obligations gotcha. that you've already okay. issued. Yeah. So, right. th so the bottom line there is what's available for Absolutely. what has typically been your pay as you go. But um, we, we divvy that up between a little bit of borrowing and a little bit of pay as you go. So. Yeah. Exactly. So, so we're starting with a number in mind, and for FY20, that number was 223528 mm -hmm. And then you can see over the five years it grows. Until the last year where it really goes up, and that's because you have some road work debt that is, will be gone by 2024. Yep. But that's, that's the bulk of your existing general fund debt that's been issued right Once now. Once you get debt free, then you can really snowball your... Well, th then, you, then you have, then you can start using that debt runoff too, um, which is a very powerful way to, to finance new, new capital. Yeah. Hmm. Um, all right, so uh, we take the top priority projects, we calculate for any debt funded ones, we calculate debt service. Um, we try to identify any additional grant opportunities that are out there um, and assign a project to a funding source that is a grant and say to basically saying to the department heads this is a great project go for a grant and if you don't get the grant then come back and we'll see but there's a grant opportunity and you should go there first um, so ryan and i work together on multiple iterations of a plan until the plan is what we call balanced, which means Rick is telling us we have X amount and the plan that we've developed is costing pretty much that amount. So you can see um, the table on the bottom of the next slide shows how our final plan balanced. Oh, go back, Ryan. Sorry. I don't know if the folks at home are looking at this or, or that. But in any case, it's this one. Yeah. So here you can see I've copied the top line is available general fund resources for new capital, which is it's the same as the bottom line of Rick's table. And then I'm telling you that based on the project plan for cash capital projects, you're spending 195, 952, and 20, and so on. For debt service, you're spending 27,000 in FY20, <coughs> and so on. 
and then there's the total. And then the bottom line, the balance, shows what you have left or what you've overspent. So the plan that Ryan and I ended up with is fair, pretty much balanced for the first four years. We use pretty much all of the money. We, we actually have a small deficit of $727 in FY21, which you know, in the mix of things is, is nothing. And then we do have a good amount left in FY24, uh, 46000 So that's, um, and it's fine to have a surplus in the plan, especially in an out year, because things can change as things go. And I know you have the committee that's going to be taking ownership of this, so they might have something to say. So the, just so I'm clear, so the, yep. pay is, the pay as we go that's on this that slide right there, um, the one that we're on, that is not to... Um, it, I thought I just heard you say it's for capital projects. Correct. So it's not just to fund our normal no, operations. So in Hubbardston, essentially, that's free cash. Okay. That's yeah. how much free cash we'd have to invest to accomplish the plan, um, minus any change in revenues or our situation. Okay. Yeah. Whereas the debt would go into the operating budget um, as part of the debt service line that or section of the budget that we present every year. Right. Good thing about debt is you put in twenty seven thousand, you can borrow two hundred. And so you can right. fund those bigger projects. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right. So then the next three slides, the last three slides here, show you a summary of how the uh, final CIP looks. So now we're just talking about those forty five projects that made it into quote the final CIP. So first I've broken it down by funding source and fiscal year. Um, you can see that there are some local dollars. Paygo, that's your that's your cash capital, so that's what you would probably use free cash to pay for. And then there's the debt, and as Ryan mentioned, the two hundred thousand dollars you would be borrowing in FY twenty, but it would only cost you the twenty seven thousand, which is the debt service. Um, Can you give us an example? So what is that two hundred thousand? So that could be a dump truck. Is that what it actually is in the plan? Currently, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we have Chapter 90 money, which is money for the roads from the state. We have MassWorks grant, which... Um, Strap grant. The Strap grant, yep. Uh, then there are other grants and sources, and that's made up of a lot of different types of grants, smaller grants, and then there's the projects that are on the tip. So you can see how those um, fall over the course of the five years. So as you can see, out of the... 17, almost $17.6 million, uh, the TIP is accounting for more than half of that. So that's state and federal money that you're bringing into the community that you're not paying anything for, essentially. Um, and the local dollars are approximately, what is it, 13%. Um, so out of the $17.6 million, about 13%, I think, is... is local dollars so that's important in terms of messaging because at the town meeting you only see the Warren articles that talk about capital it's only 13 percent of the total investment that the town's made in capital to include the monies that people have put up to get the engineering and all the other things for these major projects that are making up 54 percent of the capital fund right and that's you know you're leveraging local dollars to get projects you're also leveraging your human resources to get projects coming into the community because even if you're not putting up local dollars your department heads and the town administrator and other folks are spending time getting these grants and it's you know it's working I guess is, is the bottom line which is great the next slide shows the spending broken down by department um, and all of the roads and bridges <coughs> are going to be tagged or coded as Department of Public Works which is why you see that they have 82 percent of the spun of the spending um, and that's very typical because those projects are quite costly. They also have the most um, number of projects at 19. Uh, there's a lot of the departments are represented, especially the ones that you would think of, fire, police, uh, the town administrator handled IT projects, the town center committee, library, and the Quabbin, uh, the district, Quabbin Regional District. And this last one shows the project <coughs> count and cost by asset type. Um, this, so this is another way of thinking about it, especially for people that aren't quite sure, like where would an asset fall in terms of the department hierarchy or structure. This shows you how the pro like what types of projects are being funded by asset type. So 
three bridge projects representing a third almost of the entire uh, plan facilities projects IT projects computers servers parks and open space and then the road and infrastructure that's a, a major um, cost center too, 52 percent and then the vehicles and equipment 15 projects but only by a little bit over five percent of the entire plan uh, counted for by vehicles and equipment Um, that's the end of the presentation. <coughs> you know, we had a great time uh, working with the town of Hubbardson. We found all the department heads and board members really helpful and easy to work with. And um, Lauren <coughs> was okay too. So. <laughs> well, we only heard good things about you guys, just good. so you know. So across the board, without a doubt. Good. We, you know, appreciate you dumbing it down as much as you could for us here. And I think what this shows us is um, <clears throat> uh, if we want to come up with a, a really solid plan, um, to take care of a lot of different things, we have to separate what we led this off with, which was the buildings, into a different discussion. Yes. So I think that, that makes it very easy for us to all to understand that, that that's just the reality of mm -hmm. who we are, where, where we're at. Even though we're, we're organized, we have good teammates and all that sort of stuff, there's a certain way we're going to have to operate when it comes to some of this sort of super large ones. Yeah, well, it's not so different from... Other towns, sure. you know, right. larger towns do the same thing. You know, mm -hmm. um, it's 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 mm -hmm. not unusual for a town to use the debt exclusion as a financing vehicle for a larger project. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a new town hall, a new school, something <coughs> like that. I mean, it's just just like in your own household. If, if you have a major purchase, you're purchasing a home or perhaps a new car. Those are appropriate things to mm -hmm. issue debt for. But in, in the case of uh, large buildings, many communities use the debt exclusion. All you have to do is go to the local services database and pull down the uh, debt, debt exclusions by community, and you'll see, you know, it's some of them use it universally for everything, yeah. mm -hmm. every major, you know, even minor building projects. Mm -hmm. Not here. No, no, I, I don't think I don't think that's the right way to do it. But uh, some communities feel that they should put everything to the voters for these, um, you know, whatever idea comes into somebody's mind, and mm -hmm. uh, that gets put on the ballot. But an important piece of this in 2024, kind of just skate over it. But there's a tremendous amount of room, as Jamie you mentioned, for decisions. So um, there's also some big projects coming up, whether that is a building or fixing road and infrastructure, addressing the roof, because uh, the center school roof is, is going to be need to be replaced in the next five to ten years. So that capacity there is a conversation that we're going to have to have over the next couple years, um, because a lot of this could be shifted to, say, debt service once that road project goes off. You're talking uh, today's dollars, 160000 in that debt service, you know, extrapolated is, is quite a bit of uh, borrowing power. And as we discuss in our policies, we want to keep our debt service at 3%, so we need to replace that, that debt by investing in capital infrastructure, which again will lessen the burden on the taxpayers um, if there was that type of decision. So that's stuff that it's really important that we get volunteers for finance committee and capital planning and then this board talking about all together with the master plan what we want the town to look like. Um, and the only way to get there is to use and to adhere to all the financial policies, like generating 5% free cash so we can pay for the pay-as-you-go projects. Mm -hmm. So how, um, you know, obviously this is, uh, and I don't mean this in any way, but this is sort of easy, right? This is a static condition. We haven't done anything yet, right? So we're just projecting these five years. Yeah, this is playing Sims. It's easy. <laughs> no, no, but so you've got, so a year under your belt, right? And so yeah. as you talked about, we've got to sort of reshuffle. Um, and I guess your experience in this you know, obviously everything can't go towards plan, but how difficult is it to sort of, when things don't go quite your way and certain, you know, things you don't quite get, how difficult is it to, or is it just a snowball effect where it becomes hard to sort of reorganize things? Just a general question. Um, it's, the first year of doing the plan is the most time consuming. Um, and what will happen next year, or what should happen next year, is whoever is owning the plan, and owning the process, will take the Ryan w and, and the committee together probably will take the capital needs spreadsheet, which is that list of all of the projects that were requested, submit that back to the department heads and say, what have we accomplished? What has changed in terms of project scope, in terms of project cost, in terms of project timing, and what new projects do you need to add? And so 
they'll be working next year on the FY21 through 25 <coughs> plan. So even though we've done five years and we have a baseline, things could change in the out years or years two through five of the plan that we've done for you. Um, priorities might change, you might find, you know, a lot of things can change, but it's not as onerous to do it next year. What does become onerous is, onerous is if you don't do it for a few years and then you wanna start it back up again because then you've got to go through the whole process again. Um, and so there's momentum um, that you gain and it, and it tends to work well. Um, and so, you know, I think you can be successful. Plus we've set up the, we call them the working documents, all those spreadsheets and things, and we hand those off um, and we hope that they're user friendly and all of that. So, and we're always here um, to answer questions next year or when, you know, years, years from now if you. <laughs> <laughs> We'll be here. <laughs> Speak for yourself. I don't know. <laughs> he's already retired and he still can't stop working. So, you know, we'll see. So can I ask you a question? So yes. this chart here that shows the final project listing by department. Yes. In all the different years, 20, 21, 22, yes. 23, 24. Are these, obviously there's different things in different years. Is this recommendations by your group as to when to put these in? Almost like a, I mean, it kind of comes out to, you know, a priority list. Right. Or is this simply a financial this one fits better here, this one fits better so here. So it's triangulated. So the first thing we ask to do, and I feel like this is a local conversation, which is why I'm taking it over. Yeah. So the the first departments place their own priorities, mm -hmm. um, which if you're a good department head, everything's an emergency, right? So um, then you layer it on. I asked them to independently score so that we had a third party. And then after the department and their score, I added on just a level of my scoring and basically what that did was it fit projects into neat little spots and to add to that the form that we all had to fill out as part of whatever committee it actually had on there when do you think like for example the the high street sidewalk wouldn't come until we did main street so we put it 2023 or something for 100 grand like so that would be part of that factor as well yeah but the the departments and that's why i'm pushing for the strict adherence to policy because they should know you shouldn't be planning for next year. You should be planning for 2022, 23, or 24. You should be four years out. Next year should already pretty much be decided if we're doing the capital plan correctly. Um, so then, then they're coming to you and saying, hey, my priorities change. You know it's a true emergency because they, they've been planning for this for a couple years and this is new. Um, that's the only way to get that. Otherwise, if I used to be a department head, I need it now, right? You need it. Um, and they understand that and, and we've worked really well to try and identify all the projects so we could place them, knowing that we have limited resources as well. Yep. Mm -hmm. And when we did shift a project's timing to account for the fact that we don't have the resources this year, but we might have some next year, so we're going to shift it up. We inflate the cost a little bit um, and we also capture the fact that we moved it. Um, and so that's sort of reflected in the, in the, um, the working spreadsheets. Um, if you just give me one more um, example, the library is a great example of shifting projects and priorities. So what is the library going to look like in five years? Is there still going to be town offices in there? Do they want to go to the town and say refurbish the entire library? There's a lot of things being bantied about um, with, within the library. So they, they've laid out projects <coughs> as if today was going to be <coughs> five years from now, not knowing what the thing, but that could change immediately if, if a decision was made to say move the town offices out then they might be more aggressive with a plan to fill that space. So those are the decisions that are coming, the more difficult ones than, say, funding the plan. Any other Kay. questions? Anything else? I got nothing else. Mm -hmm. Nope. All right, thanks. Okay. Great. Thank you. Well, Thank thanks you for night. having us. And Thank see you, you around. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. We'll wrap up on this one. Yes, yep, I'll be in touch with all of that uh, stuff to transfer, and we're still working on the Gardner building regionalization thing, so I will be in your hand for a little while longer right. because I'm working on that project. Thanks, guys. Thanks, thank all right, thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay. So we are on four, we've done A, um, <clears throat> and I guess, Ryan, if you want to give us the Borrego, Solar tax agreement update. So we town council reviewed um, the final. I'll call it the final, final, final agreement. Uh, they're okay with it. Borrego's okay with it. Assessors reviewed it. They're okay with it. So we're just waiting for Zach to come back in with two checks and a signature <coughs> and sign that tax agreement. So 
Um, everybody's work on that was great. We appreciate the board's patience, but we did get that done, and I believe we got it done right. So maximum value and efficiency from our departments. Okay, um, thanks. And then, so the police policy notification. So in your packet, I sent it to you a couple weeks ago. Yep. Chief continued, so he corrected me. I said he had about 30 policies. He actually has about 200. His okay. goal is to do 30 this year, so I misspoke. Um, so he's trying to send you four or five at a time. Um, the way this works is if you have a disagreement with the policy, you would send it back to him to rewrite it. Um, that's sort of the power of the board here. So um, if there's no issue with the policies as they're revised, then you would approve your or waive your notification, and then they would become policy again. Anyone have any comments on any of the uh, police policies? Mm. No, appreciate them updating them. Okay, so you, you, you want get, to get a vote motion from us? Yes. Someone want to make a motion? I'll make the mo motion to uh, accept the police policy notification. Do I have to waive notification of that? No, motion to waive. Motion to waive. Second the motion. Any discussion? All in favor? Yes. 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 You will be getting about five every other meeting or so. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. <laughs> and then, so similar with the finance policies? These are the last four, so we could just take a moment and appreciate that. The uh, tax recap policy, I'll start with that. Um, this was, again, these are the sort of the policies and procedures that guide our finance department. They're really important, but they, they get pretty detailed. So we spent a good two hours as a finance team. Uh, ripping through these and the finance committee will also go through them as well the major parts of the the tax recap um, it sets December 15th as the the drop dead date for getting the tax recap into deal in approved by DLS this allows us to send out the uh, tax bills in time for January 1 which is really important for our revenue stream so we beat that by a couple weeks this year next year we're gonna beat that date by a couple weeks but this sets it in stone um, it also puts multiple reviews into policy, so DLS has to approve it. Uh, each The finance team has to approve it. You do, the finance committee. Um, so it puts those protections in place and also lays out the full process. So if our whole finance team left tomorrow, um, people would come in and know what to do um, the next day in terms of filing the tax recap. Okay. So I'll just keep explaining them unless someone stops me. Oh, we're good. The... Next one is the year-end closing policy. So this is something we want to tighten up and to get into writing. Uh, once the fiscal year ends, how do we close the year and get those documents into? Um, we don't have that on. I don't have it on mine. You no, should be a folder called finance policies in the. Oh oh oh! Sorry, we're still under finance policies. Yes. Sorry, my bad. There's only there's a couple more. Yeah yeah. Um, so this again. It instructs the departments on how to close, set some dates so that w we close on time. We don't have a lot of those end of year transfers that were annoying last year, um, which we are expecting right now to not have even near as close to as many as we had last year. And it sets dates to close the book, so we hit the important deadlines of uh, establishing our, or certifying our free cash in time for town meetings and setting the tax rate. This is kind of the process before the tax rate process heavily reviewed by our finance team, accountant, and assessors, and treasurer collector. So the next one is tax enforcement. Everybody loves taxes. So this is the way that we gave you a presentation this year on tax title. We're trying to prevent that, get people to pay their fair share on time. So this creates timelines for tax enforcement, sets out clear policies and goals in terms of um, how we are going to make sure um, everyone pays, pays their fair share. Their fair procedures, um, we made sure that they are doable so that we're not just saying we're gonna do this, but that uh, the timelines are in place for the treasurer collector uh, to establish them and also stuff that fits within our, our budget and our ability to do. <coughs> so if we had an unlimited budget, we could go after every uh, delinquent taxpayer um, in, in X way, we have to do it in Y way because of our budget, and this lays out how we're going to do that. And then so it is so we can keep a 98% tax collection rate. Yeah, and we're I think we're going to beat it this year, so 
um, with any luck. We're, we're doing well, and, and taxpayers, a lot of them, when we contact them, they just say, I didn't know, and then they fix it, and it's as easy, easy as that. Uh, there are some that I think, I don't think I'm fooling anybody by saying we'll never pay their taxes, but if we could get the list down to that, we'd yeah. be in, in really good shape, and then we can focus all our resources on those problems <laughs> rather than you know, just a large list of people that it's easily fixable. And then um, payment plans. So we might have something at town meeting that allows for a little bit more flexibility in terms of payment plans that would come during the warrant process but right now it, it establishes by state law what we're allowed to do which is we can allow for two years with certain payments made to pay back taxes uh, we cannot lessen or take anything less than what is owed um, so that does provide a little little restriction and that may be good or bad I don't know that'll be up to the town and then the last policy which we can all celebrate is spending in excess of appropriation so by I'm not saying this to this board, but you're not allowed to spend over what's appropriated by town meeting, but occasionally emergencies happen and things happen. So this lays out that policy and procedure. You'll remember that from the transfers that we did last year. Um, things like snow and ice are allowed to be spent in deficit. So this lays that out in black <coughs> and white um, and, and gives us more policy and strength when talking to departments about having proper payment plans, staying within appropriation, and matches our goal, which is quarterly reporting to you on uh, places where we're in trouble. Or, or good. I shouldn't always say trouble. Yeah, Sometimes I think that this, this, this is a good one. Just the, the fact that it exists. Okay, so what do you need from us on this? A motion to accept the these, these policies. policies. And then um, next year, when we go over policies, it'll be only giving you changes, and then the slate will stay the same. So. Well, make, I make the motion to accept the finance policies as presented. I'll second. Discussion? All in favor? Yes. 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 All right. Thanks for all your work on that. It was fun. <laughs> it's fun. All right. <clears throat> so we are at uh, military leave. Um, okay. So, right. So full disclosure, Ryan and I spoke about this a little last week, maybe. Yes, Friday. <clears throat> Ryan has expressed uh, previously how, how um, I don't want to use the word conflict, use the word whatever you want, but obviously this directly affects you uh, as far as this policy. And, and um, I'm the only town employee that's currently in the military, so any military leave policy by default would only impact me. Um, but I'm also under contract and don't necessarily fall within the purviews of the policy. So, so can I ask you? applying this to me but I'll, of course I'll provide expertise can, can you just give us a, a little bit of a background can you can you first explain I know it's probably very detailed but the general bullet points the main bullet points of USERA so in under it's USERA was essentially created because it's difficult to find employment um, when you're in the Mass National Guard because your obligations to the military are, are non there's no negotiating there so if they order you to do something you go and then you need protections in some cases from your employers. It's a little bit different in the municipal world because typically municipal governments um, have set procedures and policies in place. It's especially important in the civilian sector. Uh, so I should say the non-government sector is a very military term I used. So the um, USERA lays out some things that we cannot get around. Um, so this policy just essentially accepts USERA and then layers on top of it. So when I was hired, I was asked to look at military leave policy because I included it as part of my negotiation. What is the, the military leave policy? Like many small towns in Massachusetts, our policy deferred to the state policy, which you can only do by accepting a local option, which we did not accept. So essentially, we had no policy um, except for USERA. That is fine as long as the, the town does not want to provide paid military leave uh, to schools. To uh, soldiers, sailors, Marines. Because so. basically what USERA does is says you're going to get your job back. Yes. But you're not going to get paid for not being at your job. Correct. They cannot force, and you would definitely look at a small business and they couldn't necessarily afford it. So you're not necessarily guaranteed your job, but a job of similar sure. uh, statute. But we, so we negotiated five paid um, leave days. I don't know what words to use. Five paid military leave days. Is that how to word it? Yes. Just because we were negotiating a number of different items, and that's what we came to, right? Yes. I mean, there's no real full-on rhyme or reason. 
And so what we have the option to do is, is that is just a contractual obligation that we have um, with Ryan at this point. But in, in either parallel with, with modifying that, his existing contract, to mirror what we ultimately come up with as far as an actual policy, because we didn't have one, we'd have, that's just an agreement, a, a piece of an agreement that we have. We have the, the, um, the option to, to keep Ryan at his five, because he was, you know, said he would. I'd sign a contract. Sign a contract. Um, and then <clears throat> set a policy for some other number that may, maybe makes more sense in reality uh, for the future. And either have it, have, it, have it like that, or we can discuss and set a policy with a certain amount of days and then amend Ryan's contract to affect that. So that's what we're, we don't necessarily have to decide that tonight, I don't think. Or do you want us to decide that no. tonight? This is just an opening of discussion. It is, it is. So again, I, I guess, uh, does anyone understand sort of what we're talking about here? Well, uh, what I understand a little bit, Ryan, on that is where it says, uh, I guess I'm just confused, where it says option one, adopt the state statute, or option two, mimic the state option. So what it, what is, the, to me they sound the same, so what's the difference? <laughs> so, like a, so like any good local option, the state has a basically a blanket option that you can go to town meeting and say, we accept, um, what is it, 59... Should know this. I'm a terrible form of VSO 3359, which says, um, and forgive me for being a little. Um, I don't like it. <laughs> Basically, it says not to exceed 17 days in the fiscal year, and then not to exceed 17 days in the federal year, and not to exceed 34 days in any year. Which to anybody who reads it doesn't make any sense. So basically, what they're saying is July 1 to June 30th, you can't. You can get 17 days paid military leave. In the federal year, which is October 1 to September 30th, you can get 17. That's so ridiculous. So then there's been a huge discussion, literally for decades, over that interim time. Does that mean you have to use your 17 days, which yeah. um, historically is the time you would do annual training, so it kind of made sense. But most towns, when they get sued, um, they just default to giving 34 days. In a calendar year in, or in a calendar year of paid military leave which for someone like me would be seven seven weeks of military paid leave which is a lot for you know a person with my responsibilities so um that that is certainly acceptable but then the town would have to decide how it interpreted that 17 17 and 34. so another completely acceptable option is to come up with your own or to mimic the states which means saying some do 34 days of paid military leave. Some do 17, because they believe that was the original intention. And then any number between zero and 17 uh, is better than, than what we have now. So the, just to put it in context, the average guardsman does two days a month and two weeks a year. So that's about 10 days of mandatory time. In today's current climate, in the op temple for most guard units, it's somewhere between two weeks and three weeks, which is about 15 days. And then if you do any professional development, which you need to do to progress, um, or if you're in a, in, a, in a higher rank like I am, you're gonna do extra days here and there because you're just required to. So the average soldier does, soldier sales, sailor, marine, or coasty does um, anywhere from, from 10 days, which is the, the, probably the minimum, to could be up to 30, 40, depending. So th this is separate from getting called, uh, called on a deployment. Yeah, so deployment is Title 10 which is a whole different ball game. And this, this would say to, to that, that person who's being deployed, um, we're here when you get back. Or you would get to use all of your leave days that are allowed by the town's policy uh, up until, so let's say you left on January 1 and you did five days, you'd be paid to January 5th and then you would return when you returned. And there's also, I don't wanna get too crazy down the rabbit hole, but there are schools that are 60 days long, right? So this addresses that and saying, We'll give you your leave days, and then you're off our books until you come back from military duty, and then you return back. So this is really just a, a compensation thing from our standpoint, because, <laughs> because you know, we'll obviously have to get, let's just say it was a four-month deployment, right? God forbid. But um, That would be a blessing. Oh, four months. okay. <laughs> right. If I get deployed, you'll see you in 12. Okay. Uh, <laughs> right. So we would be looking for an interim, you know, and all that, um, and having to incur costs of an interim mm -hmm. as well as paying someone who's <laughs> not here. So that's what we have to sort of see is what our town can afford. You know, of course, of course we want to do both, you know, to the maximum extent. Well, we no, have. it doesn't affect the deployment because we're not going <clears> to, <throat> if, if we adopt, 
or mimic the state option. Let's say we say we're going to get 34 days. We're only on the hook for 34 days. Right. After 34 days, then you 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 would or somebody else in the in the military would live off of their pay from the military, okay. not from the town. Okay, correct? so that's what Section 10 is, or what you were just talking about? It's a full on deployment. So the town would only be on the hook for what it authorized. So if it did 34 days, okay, which I think is too much, but if it did 34 days, then um, I'm going to get killed by my military friends, but <laughs> then that's what you'd be on the hook for. But you, you know, would incur that cost plus the interim, so there might be some financial ramifications there, paying two people for a month. And some of this is weekend work, right, like one weekend a month? Correct. Yes. <laughs> so that really comes into play when you're talking about uh, public safety, DPW, uh, folks that, that may come in that serve. We don't have any right now, but they, you may hire someone you know, relatively soon. They tend to attract that type of person. Um, sure. Then you're talking about leave days that come on weekends and other things. So there's overtime implications, et cetera. Well, it's in snow removal, things like that. Do they right? get paid by the government? They do. So we are paid for our service. State active duty is and pretty well paid. And when they're deployed mm -hmm. to active duty, that's is that a different pay scale? It's the same pay scale. Same pay scale. It's a little incorrect. So, um, if you're over for more than 30 days, you get a different basic housing allowance than you do BAH Type Two or Type One. Um, way too complicated for for this. But that also has to do with rank, also. Yes. And so, if I could just, I'm gonna just read this real quick. You guys might have already looked at it, but I, I just want to understand this. <coughs> this is a reemployment timetable. So, to be eligible for protection under USERRA, the service member must report back to work or apply for reemployment within the following guidelines. One to thirty days of service. Report next scheduled work day. So that means if you're gone to one to thirty, you got to come right back to work. Yeah. Thirty-one to one hundred eighty days of service. Apply within fourteen days following completion of service. The word apply wasn't in that previous one. What does that mean? Do you know? Uh, apply oh. for reinstatement is I think what it means. Uh, back at the civilian job. Yes. Okay. And then the other one is one hundred eighty-one plus days of service. Apply within ninety days following completion of service. So within that. Say there's 90 days. Okay, so, so say you, you take 89 days before you apply for who's paying. I, know, I realize we're only on the hook for 34 if we say 34. But if in that sort of scenario that I'm saying there, are you just on your own? So you, you've been discharged and you've just you've been walking around for 89 days not going to work? <laughs> so you would have terminal leaves. Okay. Um, no, no, yes. Another term. <laughs> so you'd have leave at the end of your tour. Uh, hopefully you'd had some. When you deploy, you can't use leave, obviously, so you have some at the end. Okay. Um, the 90 days is the allow for typically under USERA, medical treatment, readjustment. So you want your employee back and back, not gotcha. taking two weeks and then saying, you know, I'm going to need more time. Gotcha. Get your affairs in order. But that's, USERA is non negotiable, that you have to allow for that. Yep. So what do you think is a fair amount of days then that the town should offer? <laughs> <laughs> To so like, like you said, it, it, you know, do your duties, advance in rank, and certainly I give a lot of credit to anybody who's willing to sign up to do these things. So I, my personal opinion is, you know, I think we should support these folks that want to do that. Um, but what do you think is a fair number for somebody who uh, who can can do that in advance and and not be hindered and worry about them, you know making bills paid or you know, anything like that? Um, a little uncomfortable giving a number, but the I, I will say. Well, you, you just should said, be. You, you just said thirty-four is too much. Yeah, he did. You, but you he did, didn't mean you it. Did, you he still. So. I think that's so, the number I'm paying So towards. full full candor, I lobbied pretty hard to turn that into thirty-four in my previous job. So um, I'm not saying I'm against it. It's just to adopt it blanket as a town who's never had it. I don't know if that's the right approach to just say we're going to give the maximum days possible because we don't know the exposure to that. Um, the and what's the risk of exposure? Is that there's overlapping. Leaves right for a small town with say there's three or four employees that. Well, I think it would be different too if it was a DPW versus a well, town administrator. So based if a on police the officer salary. took 34 days off, then you'd be paying overtime to cover <coughs> those shifts plus paying that person 30. So it can add up. In cities, it gets really expensive, mm -hmm. which is why they try and control. Um, this. Yeah. So this I'm sorry. to answer, I'm sorry to answer your question. The I think there should be something. I said that when I was negotiating. So, um, a, t a town should offer that incentive because of me going to five, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Dropping the hammer. <laughs> Stingy. <laughs> no idea what I'm I was on the phone with my mom. I was like, this guy. You know, so. um, 
you know, but it's it's where the town is comfortable starting. And I think anything is better than zero. I'd be proud to have helped move it forward. Um, so the I told you the average days yep. is it's 14 days, but you have weekends in there. So plus usually you have one or two extra like weekend days that you need in there. And then there's professional development. So I'd say that lands you somewhere between 10 and 17 is kind of typical if you're going to adopt something. The other uh, branches of service. <laughs> Brian, I just have another I, question. I, I just want a okay. question on that. The other branches of service, okay, other than National Guard, uh, a person serves and um, is discharged, but they have a reserve obligation. Yes. Is this cover that aspect of uh, the reserve requirement as opposed to uh, in your case, it's a guard re requirement. If if you're Across in the, the board, is it? If you're in the active reserves, these these terms they're crazy. Yeah, inactive, inactive. So if you're in the active reserves, meaning you're drilling as a reservist, it's the same as being in the guard. Uh, mm -hmm. The days are different. The commitments you don't have to get called up during, say, hurricanes, for example, but um, which is also a thing. Did you know the Coast Guard guys were called Coasties? I didn't know that till tonight. I did know that. Mm -hmm. oh, you did. Well, <coughs> I don't know. Uh, uh, Ryan, question on uh, just. The pr proof of, uh, you know, it says here, if you want 30 days, the town requests a letter from the employee commander, employee's commander. Um, is it hard to prove, like, say you're going to, I'm going away for uh, maneuvers or whatever next weekend. Is it hard, like, don't other employers want to just proof of that other than a 30-day more, uh, a 30-day deployment? Yeah. So it's easy, like, didn't you have a stub or something? Say, look, I went, you know, that it is. Prove. It is pretty easy. You'd have orders, a letter from your commander, or it's all doable. I would just say I would want proof of any leave. The law is written to try and prevent the, the town, the city, the municipality from blanket denying things, because uh, that's happened, uh, especially when you're dealing with, say, 18 to 25-year-old soldiers who don't have the self-advocacy, who get scared by an employer who says, if, if you go do that extra duty, no, or, you or can't, et cetera. You'll lose your job. Um, it's very rare, but it does happen, and that's why it exists. But on the other side of the coin, um, you wouldn't want me, as your town administrator, just volunteering for every order that came up and taking advantage of a policy um, because I knew that it was in place. It's also rare, but the town needs to protect from that. So th these laws are like a balance between the two. You really want to reward military service. I don't think anyone doesn't. Um, it's, but it's the liabilities that can be created, et cetera, that you want to be careful of. It's a terrible way to say it, especially as a veteran advocate, but it is, it is true. I'm trying to give you the best advice possible. So the, let's say 15 days, um, round number, that's automatically paid or that has to come out of vacation, your accrued vacation? So it would be, if you were approved of military leave, it would be added on to, to the vacation. So you get 15 days of military leave only to be expended if you use them for military purposes. With no buyback options or any of that sort of stuff? I would stipulate that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because right now, for example, I have, I probably do 20, 15 to twenty military days a year, so I'll probably use two, three weeks vacation to to make sure I still have the. the yeah, and when you say buyback, you mean like no carryover? Correct. Yeah, all of the stuff that would okay. apply to no anything left over. over. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because the point of the policy is you served and we rewarded you during that year. Reset, reward again, not to accrue a massive liability for military service. So we have a DPW guy who's obviously uh, gets whatever 20 days, 15 days, whatever we give him, give him, um, and they their drills are all on weekends that they're not needed. The DPW, I mean, at the end of the year, they still have 15 days to use whatever they need to. They would have resets. annual training, so it's probably a minimum of 10 they would use. Have you ever seen? I hate to even ask this question, but have you ever seen where they have? Uh, there's no policy where. Um, what's been adopted for compensation from the current employer is the delta between the normal wage in the civilian job and the what you receive at military service? Yeah, so there is a, st <coughs> a st state statute for longer orders. Okay. So that's for um, the difference between mm -hmm. base pay, it's usually base pay, and uh, what you would be making normally and say your job is a a uh, DPW worker, policeman, firefighter. <coughs> it's really hard to calculate sometimes. I'm sure. It would take an H I wouldn't be comfortable doing it. I would have to Counting. have an HR professional help me because 
what counts as your normal salary? Does it include overtimes, details, et cetera? Sure. Um, okay. It's doable, and it's definitely worth it, and people earn it. But Was well, there anything else you think you need to let us know about you know the, the, this policy we haven't already discussed um, as far as the guts of it? Just how uncomfortable I am with <laughs> having it. All right, so I'm, I'm going to suggest, first of all, that instead of going to the town meeting option, we mimic... We would do option B. You feel comfortable about understanding it? I do. Okay. I do. <laughs> so I, I would suggest that we, um, <clears throat> only if you guys are comfortable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I would suggest that we we go to mimic the state option. So we have a, our own policy that we can we can amend okay. and change. Okay. And if we adopt the state, where I think we're kind of stuck mm -hmm. with what they have. Um, so I would suggest, first of all, if you guys are comfortable mimicking the state option, and it's just a matter of how many days you want to give. 17. How about 17? Cuts in half from the 34 that was on there. And it's, we don't know anyway, okay. so it's, there's the rationale. Okay. So what are you with? 17. 17. And half mm -hmm. of the 34 that was there. What do you think? No. Interesting. All right, so I'll make a motion to approve uh, the military uh, leave option, which is option two, as stated, mimic the state option with a uh, calendar year days of 17. Second the motion. And this discussion, um, do we want to, within this motion, or to make another, or just have it as another discussion, discuss, <laughs> discuss <three minutes>. uh, <laughs> whether to amend Ryan's current contract to reflect our current policy? And with the, with the thought that we didn't, re and I will just take, I didn't negotiate that part of it because I had any real basis for it. Um, so, I don't know. Uh, that's just a, this is discussion here. I think it's a good idea, but we should probably do this motion first and then make a second motion to do that. All right, sounds good. Any further discussion? All in favor? Yes? Yes. yes. Okay. All right, yes. I'll make another motion to uh, amend uh, Ryan's employment contract to um, for military leave to follow along the adopted policy for the town. Second the motion. Um, so, in discussion, you, you'll draft up. Because we'll want to know what that you'll draft something up for us. Yeah. Okay. So what do you have presently have? Five. Five days. Okay. So we want to do that amended based on you know uh, future <coughs> uh, review of the terminology that you know something like that. What he said. <laughs> Second. <laughs> yes. It's my okay. job to recommend here, so I would recommend having that apply on July one. Amendment. The July one of nineteen. Or, or July one retroactive. retroactive. July one of next year. Okay, so I'll, I'll slightly amend my motion to uh, have that apply for uh, as of July one. Taking effect as taking effect as of July one, two thousand nineteen. Oh, second that. Another amendment. No amendment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, any further discussion? <clears throat> All in favor? Yes. 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 <clears throat> okay. So now that that's awkwardness is over, if I could just say um, I appreciate that as someone who's hidden their military service to try and get a job before, uh, who's coached guardsmen and reservists to take it off their resume and if you remember in my interview I didn't want to talk about it until you guys brought it up uh, it's for that reason because when you have lots of service members in the guard and they're doing their military duty it can create some significant overtime problems and other liabilities I don't, I don't think we'd have that here unless we hired a rash of guardsmen which I hope we do <laughs> but um, as, as someone who's gone through that uh, I appreciate it one of the high points of uh, your interview and discuss talking about things with you was was the fact that you were in the military, and there was another gentleman here who was also, I think, a captain in mm -hmm. the in the army, um, I think the reserves. And um, to me, you guys stood out head and shoulders with everybody else. And, and so it can be it can be difficult. It can also be helpful. So I don't want to say it's all negative, but um, policies like this help attract people with those qualities. And that gentleman you're talking about is now the town. Uh, administrator in Maynard, and we talk all the time. Really? Yeah. So yeah. Greg. He's a, Greg. He's a great guy. Hmm. We talked uh, Friday. He's doing really well. So. A bigger budget. Much bigger. <laughs> <laughs> more staff. <laughs> all right, so one more item of new business here. We have the hay license. Um, uh, that we're so I hope that good. Brian Bullock would allow me to do this joke, but he said um, – at some point, someone's going to talk to you about a hay license, and I tried to make it my whole career without dealing with a hay license, so good luck. <laughs> so I did a lot of Thanks. research on this, texted them, said thank you. Uh, but So this is a revenue source for us. We have conservation land um, 
on Mount Jefferson and we hay this land, we get... Oh, we know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, this called? Bob Links. Bob Links. Bob Links. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. So this is something, I've talked to a few farmers, it's, uh, it's an attractive bid, so we want to put this out to bid to see best price possible for this land. Um, I, re- I reviewed this based off the old bid, and I also sent it to Open Space and Jassy Direct Conservation. J- Jassy has looked at it, um, and they're they've given their approvals for for this bid. So if this board's comfortable with the IFB, mm-hmm. then we would send it out probably around February first to try and um, procure a license by say mid March. We might set the date for just to give it some time and uh, get a new five-year contract in place. So it mimics the old dates, the dates that we talked about ad nauseum, as far as when the haze could be done, whatnot. It mimics the same ones that we had previously. So the change to your previous vote then um, just changed the payment to November 1st, just to give more more time for the farmer to pay. So they would pay August 1st and November 1st. It used to be October 1st. Okay. Just based mm-hmm. on the history of payment, it made more sense to me. Mm-hmm. Right, I'll make a motion to accept the amended uh, hay lease contract as presented i'll second that discussion it's a um <coughs> sorry just it's an invitation for bid invitation for bid as presented i'll second that discussion all in favor yes yes, yes. 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 okay old business anyone got anything you want to bring up at this point no, just Maybe. the flag yeah right flag. Oh. oh yeah so um there was a miss it's my fault so there was a miscommunication between the tree warden, Rick is his Rich. name? Rich. who also does tree work in town, assisting the tree warden occasionally, and um, this board. So the tree warden was out of town, and I was trying to get his blessing on the fix, and then also fulfill the board, wanted to know about the fix. So it could have happened earlier. I think we have a thing in place. I emailed um, Jeff just to make sure, but it's essentially a very small manicure of the trees in order to allow the flag so he said there would be one branch that was like this but Mm -hmm. otherwise uh, good conservation and um, we can get that done so all right and he was going to clean out anything dead as well let's do it okay for the ground cost yeah any other old business all right ryan you want to take us through your town administrator report yes Okay, so first, uh, FY20 budget update. So uh, big news is we certified our free cash at 401513 Our policy that we passed was aiming to create 5% free cash in our budget, which would have been 451150 So we came pretty close. Um, and I think with some of our revenue projection goals, we should be able to hit that 5% every year. Fingers crossed. So... Um, Thank you to the accounting team for that. We also got some good news. The Worcester Regional Retirement System, they make you come out to a breakfast before they give you your assessment. Assessment. Basically, you sit down and everyone's flipping through the thing to find out <laughs> the assessment. So the guy next to me was really mad. I was really happy. We went down 1%. We're projecting a 9% increase there. So uh, that's not going to happen every year, but we can celebrate it when it does. Um, I'm going to present the budget to the staff, or basically a final first draft to the staff um, at a staff meeting on January 30th. I do have in here that the presentation is going to be on the 4th. Our budget calendar, February 4th. Our budget calendar has it on February 4th. I will not have the school numbers until the 14th. So I'm asking the board to allow a change to the budget calendar for me to present our proposed budget on the 19th so we can have Makes some sense. real yep. school numbers. Absolutely. Other assessments to Rutland Regional. I just feel like um, one of the problems you had with the budget last year was having it change a lot. I feel like we can give you a real good first draft on the 19th as opposed to the 4th. Okay. Also, news there, the um, we're meeting, trying to meet with the schools to set up a date where they give us like their first draft assessment date so we can have this not be a thing in the future. We get it on this date, and then we present our budgets following that. Uh, there's still a chance that the budgets change, obviously, is the way schools work, but... Um, we'd like to get that agreement in place. The library roof procurement will be opening those tomorrow. Uh, we had a lot of registered uh, bidders, so we're expecting some activity there. 
Um, we'll have an update for you at your next meeting as to who was awarded the library roof bid. Uh, NALT Architects is working with us a lot there, are really professional. It's been great to work with them. Software conversions, uh, version eight of our assessing software, which is a necessary fix, but also a big upgrade in our service capabilities. Uh, we've contracted with them and um, they're going to install those in April, that upgrade in April. This is part of the community compact IT grant that we put in for, so this is already paid for. And then we're also upgrading our um, server there as part of that. <laughs> I don't know what a server is, but if you do this motion, yeah. it's a server. <coughs> And then we're demoing building department software to try and uh, upgrade that as well. And we're probably going to beat Gardner in that. So <coughs> I feel good about that. And I made fun of the mayor about that. Uh, Green Communities Grant. So this was something that's kind of was on the radar when I first started and was pushed off for other priorities. But we're back. And it looks like we're going to be able to apply for this green community status in the fall. We've already gotten our criteria one accepted. I'll have more updates on this. But... Um, MRPC is taking the lead on this and we should get that in place. We'll probably have some Warren article that goes with it. Uh, the big thing would be adopting the stretch code, which is the building code, which has been changed a lot. And we're gonna bring the, the building commissioner in to talk to you about that so you understand it more. Um, but they have that in Gardner. Fire union negotiations, I'm starting those on Thursday. We're meeting with the fire union on Thursday. So we should have some updates for you there. Who are you meeting with? Uh, Troy. Just Troy? Yeah. Just me and him. So we'll have uh, some updates about that first meeting um, at your next meeting. Monty Tech, I went to Monty Tech last week. I met with the superintendent and the business director. Uh, we talked a lot about how we can strengthen our relationship, get more information from them, get their projections earlier. I think it's important to note that their budget process is completely different than any of ours. So they put a draft budget out in March and then they don't. they still haven't approved their 19 budget yet. But they did tell us our assessment's gonna go down, so we'll forgive them for that. But the, uh, that means there's changes in that budget, and we definitely won't know that number until, until March. And you might know that, I did not. Um, I did get to see the school's machinery shop, the carpentry, and their cabinet making departments. They're, that is an impressive school. They do some really cool things, and I did deliver the letter that you asked me to, thanking them for the lean-to and for the wreath that they donated. Uh, I got a lot of employee recognition this week, so I wanted to recognize our senior workers. They're managed by Claudia. They work throughout the town, and they help us organize, reduce file backlogs, provide better service and information. Um, they're extremely dedicated, doing work that allows the town staff to do other things. Without them, we would be just doing uh, backlogs of files all the time. So they're really important. They, they help uh, pretty much every department has, has used them in some way. And then... Um, so we all fight over their different talents to see how we're going to use them. Also really wanted to recognize, um, I went today to a chimney fire and observed the uh, fire, fire department working. They also had uh, some mutual aid in Gardner and I believe one other spot plus two calls today and it was nine degrees out. The police department was there directing traffic and they do their community work. And again, it was nine degrees. Our DPW went by with the sidewalk plow. Um, and we're out there for 26 hours on Monday clearing snow to make our roads look nice. It's just, I was out there for 10 minutes. Everybody made fun of me and I came back inside. Uh, I just appreciate them having to work out for a couple hours in conditions like that today. And some topics coming up. Uh, budget presentation, as we, as we just talked about, fire union, CBA, again, talked about it. Uh, still want to work on our community benchmarking as sort of a goal for the end of this fiscal year. Our updated road maintenance plan, um, we've had Travis digging deep in the weeds on this. We want to have our public budget hearing and present a, a, a plan for your approval. And then uh, human resource policy updates will be pivoting from the budget to human resource for pretty much the rest of the year. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, okay, so we've got town administrator review process up there next. We'll, uh, yeah, this was just more to um, start the conversation of it's, um, believe it or not, been here one year on February 21st. Yep. So um, we have started the review process for all employees, and uh, you're responsible for my review. Mm -hmm. So just wanted to see how you want to do that, how I can help facilitate and get it on the radar. But it's one of those things that's easy to forget. Right, uh, and is important 
important not to forget. So last time we, we did a, um, uh, a fairly standard rating system, right, for your first review? So we took the same form that we review employees and... Um, how, how did you find um, that applicable to your, you know, our reviews and your understanding and whether it's relevant towards helping you understand what, you know, um, we're thinking of things? Is that a valuable tool or is do you think we should think about some, doing something else? I think so. I like the individual feedback. Um, you're all different and you all require different things and that's important for me to know. Um, plus it gives me a better base to improve from, which is my goal. All right, so, so I did like the, it was sort of more encompassing when everybody did it. Format, okay. So you guys, are, everybody all right with doing it sort of the same way we did last time? Mm -hmm. So we'll just sort of keep it on the agenda, I guess whatever makes sense, getting it on there so that we have a sort of a deadline. I think what we did last time is we, did we discuss it um, in executive session? No. No. Mm -mm, no. We just straight up an open session, but. Um, yeah, we just, yeah. So you did, the, this is allowed, as long as this prescription is followed, you did it on your own. Yep. You submitted it to me for That's consolidation. Right. We gave it to Jamie. Uh, were you the compiler? Yeah. 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 We compiled it and didn't deliberate. Correct. Um, and then it was presented in public to discuss. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Anybody else want to be a compiler this time? No, Jamie did fine. All right. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Jamie. Right, Jamie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, but let's, you know, we're getting close. So would you say what date is your, I mean, I know we have to be exact year. But February 21st is my February point. 21st, so um, um, I guess maybe the, the, the mid-March, is that all right with you? We'll, we'll have, um, we'll have the forms maybe, uh, I'll send out the forms to everyone. Okay, so we'll all have them. That's my next question. I and then we'll, we'll put it on the, the whatever the, that first March meeting is for uh, an agenda item. Okay. Okay. Okay, so we've got some appointments. Um, you want to take us through them, Larry? <clears throat> yes. Sean Dame, he is the alternate inspector of wires. Daryl Sweeney's the inspector of wires in town, um, but it looks like he will be out for a short period of time. So we, you know, it's also always good to have an alternate. We missed him at the last meeting. Um, Francois Steiger, he is looking to be on the affordable housing committee as a um, resident, not as a planning board member, as he's the associate member. Um, Donna McGrath, she is looking to go on the Economic Development Committee. Brianna Whitney on the Historical Committee. Uh, Carol Whitney as well on the Historical Committee, but that seems to be full, so she's going to be going on as an alternate until somebody drops off. It's always good to have somebody in place just in case. Um, Caitlin Thiem, I know we had discussed this last time. We I had received an email from Bill Shea regarding the fact that she has not been at meetings, um, not answered emails. I did send her out an email as well, letting her know that we did receive a letter stating that she hasn't been in attendance, has missed meetings, and I said, please respond by a certain date if you are still interested, and I did not hear from her. Okay. She was appointed at the meeting prior with her appointment to be effective in June, or expired in June, so July, um, and she has also not been sworn in. So. Um, we will accept that as a resignation. Alice Libdahl, she's here. She's looking to go on the Affordable Housing Committee as a planning board member. Mm -hmm. And Roberta um, <coughs> Tebow as the assessing administrative assistant. And so Ryan can explain that one. On the last two, um, Alice is here to talk about the Affordable <coughs> Housing Committee, also meeting with some of the members tomorrow, not a quorum, to discuss what that committee is <coughs> about, to give you more information about that. Also, um, we have a, a, a leave situation in the assessing office, so Roberta is being temporarily appointed uh, last week to um, to whenever the maternity leave is over, in order to cover that office. So that would expand her hours over a part-time hour, but I did check with several HR professionals, and as long as it's an interim appointment, which this is, uh, she retains her part-time status, and we don't um, run into a situation with uh, retirement benefits, et cetera. We vetted that out. Uh, we thought Bobby was a good pick to cover that office. Has already received some training, and we'll make sure that 
uh, when Jenny comes back, the office is, there's just a pile of stuff that she can just continue to do her work. RRG is okay with it, and um, the Board of Assessors is also notified as well. Can we handle all of these with one motion, or do we need to do each one I think, I think separately? Several, right? I mean, the appointments, yeah, the resignation. I don't know, Alice, um, did, did you want to, I mean, you're here. Did you want to comment anything on? on uh, I, don't I don't necessarily want to talk. Okay. I just um, I just thought maybe you wanted people here. I am on the planning board. The planning yeah. board is serving as the Affordable Housing Committee, yep. but when that vote was made, I wasn't on the planning board. Okay. So it's mostly a matter of sort of joining that group. Okay. And um, hardly anybody's on it from the original committee, so we do need to work on it with, with Ryan and figure out where we go from here a little bit. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks for joining it. Um, but it feels like we probably have to, we can do a bunch of these appointments, but not the resignation and right. whatever else. That would right? be the exception. And I, I would, would think. do Bobby as the exception probably as well, just because okay. of different okay. circumstances as it's based on a temporary. So just for, uh, I move to uh, <laughs> accept the appointments. Want me to just read the names or sure for the record of uh, Sean Dame, alternate inspector of wires, Francois Stiger, Affordable Housing Committee, Don McGrath. Economic Development Committee, Brianna Whitney, Historical Committee, Carol Whitney, Historical Committee, Alternate, Alice Livedahl, Affordable Housing Committee. I'll second that. Discussion? All in favor? Yes. 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 I also move to accept the uh, resignation of Caitlin, how do you pronounce the last name? Theme, I believe. Theme from the Cultural uh, Council resignation. Honor for resignation. I'll second that. Discussion? All in favor? Yes. 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 Also, I move to <coughs> accept the appointment of Roberta Thiebel, assessing administrative assistant it's as an interim appointment. I'll second that. Any discussion? All in favor? Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, we are up to committee updates here. Uh, the QEMP task force. Um, Thanks, I did. I did warn her. She mm -hmm. was okay with this. Waiting. Oh, okay. I didn't want him to think I was rude. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, have a good night. Yeah. Good night. Thank, Thank you. Good night. An interesting meeting. Very good. <laughs> so the um, QEMP task force. Uh, there's no update there. Um, Ryan, I don't know. If, have you heard anything further from where it stands? Um, with you know any, I haven't got any emails relative to where things stand with the new Brain Tree closing school and all that stuff. Just um, just TA chatter at the MMA conference. Will they? Won't they? And, and when the next thing is, but nothing official. See, no. so that came up in the in the, the meeting. I know I explained before. We we'll just spend a second on this. They the, the 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 school was very clear that the process could just stop at any time. So it, until it got to that final vote of the school committee, where they would then have three yeah. to six months to do that. <coughs> but it didn't have to. It could just stop. So I, again, I haven't looked into it. I don't Did really they know. Have a certain period of time to go to the next stage. <coughs> It, the next no 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 the next stage is just to be on the next or uh, uh, upcoming meeting for I don't believe there was an actual time frame for if an upcoming school committee meeting okay. for them to vote it and that would trigger the time frame after that so I don't know I don't, I'm not going to try to have to go to town meeting for them right yeah. within three one of the reasons that would stop it is if the select board had an entered into an agreement correct would would the enter, district that would allow yeah. a similar yeah, sort of relationship so like we have with taps taps yeah correct yeah. okay thank you. Uh, and the town center committee, I canceled the meeting this month because we're still waiting on, uh, you know, whatever. We've been a long process, and we've been on a long process. So um, we'll just, I guess, the next piece of that is going to be the uh, the state getting back to us on, on our revised design, 25% design. Um, uh, matters, anything come up not reasonably anticipated by the chair? Nothing from me. Anybody else? Before I forget, what's the status of the fire department, the um, exhaust? <laughs> Um, so we're in a standstill right now, and I just would rather not say it publicly, okay. but I will have an update for you. So we're we're discussing things with council right now that that are sure not certainly not something we're trying to hide, but will be available at our next meeting okay. or an update. I should know tomorrow or the day after. Basically, we have a disagreement about the, the total cost of the project as it was bid. So we're reviewing um, bid law. Okay. Gotcha. And not while you're on the fire department, the fire truck is what, like 
half built or something. Oh, I think it's going to be oh, almost ready. I don't get to be the first <laughs> ride, but I think it's going to be soon, <laughs> like a month or so. And also the tree warden did email me back. Um, and he said that uh, it's fine with him. So if the board's okay with it, we're just going to have Rich cut the trees. Sounds yeah. good. Trim the trees. <laughs> <laughs> Prune. Um, any, anything else anybody got? <coughs> Public press? Hmm. Uh, Ryan, did that flag get torn? Yeah. <coughs> so we have a new one the same size? Um, when the trees are fixed. I didn't want to get a new one until the trees were fixed. So. But this, that same size is nice. Yeah. <coughs> Make the motion to... Be surprised uh, unless I pause. Are we ready for that? To adjourn and move into executive session? We are. Okay. I move to adjourn the, the open meeting and purpose of moving into executive session. One, do you want me to... Yeah, mm -hmm. go ahead. You want to read it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Executive session. Session under GLC 30A 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to litigation in the matter of Normington and all versus Galvin and all U.S. District Court number 18 CV 11676 NMG. If the chair declares it, declare. hmm? oh, I have to read that. If the chair declares that discussing the matter in an opening meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the town, votes may be taken. Not to return. Mm -hmm. Not to not return. To, and with no, not, yeah, no intention, intention of not returning to open session. I'll second that. Okay. Jeff? Yes. Dan? Yes. Pat? Yes. Jimmy? Yes. Mike? Yes. You can pull the mic. Oh. Do we want to try the cell phone or do we want to go? I